Bodies are dropping left and right in military base as a little boy is walking through all the chaos, but he couldn't care less about all the deaths he just caused, and instead, he is just interested in finding a woman called Asaka who he has been looking for. A door opens and that same Asaka is seen being held at gunpoint by a woman who we haven't gotten the backstory for. Asaka is surprised to see Yogiri somehow managed to get into this base where she was held captive, but the one holding her hostage threatens to kill her if Yogiri takes another step closer. As she points the gun at Asaka's cheek, Yokiri just stares at her for a bit, and soon after, she drops dead. Asaka has no idea what Yokiri did, but once again, he cares very little for the life he just took, and is just happy to have his Asaka back. And now, Yokiri is being shaken awake by a different girl who he doesn't recognize. She tells him that her name is Danura, and he asks what she's freaking out over, but she is more surprised that he was able to stay asleep through the huge incident that happened to them. There are bodies on the floor of the bus, and she's got no idea what they are going to do. Outside the bus, they notice a tail moving, so Yogiri throws a microphone at one of the appendages that had stabbed through one of his classmates, and it causes a wyvern that was outside the bus to writhe in pain. It gets up in a position that makes me question the nature of the appendage that was in that boy, and then it charges at the two of them in the bus, so Damara is sure that they are going to die here since there is nothing they can do against a beast as powerful as that thing, but in the heat of the moment, she presses her melons against Yokiri, and that gets him to care just enough to say something and cause the dragon to drop dead before them. Donora is confused and doesn't understand what just happened, so Yogiri pulls out a video game and tells her to calm down so they can talk, but she gets upset that he thinks now is a good time to be playing games. She asks if he doesn't want to leave the bus already, but he sees no reason to be in a rush since there is no guarantee that the outside will be safe for them to venture out into. She understands his point but asks that he put the game down and take the situation seriously for now. Yokari obliges and asks to be informed of what happened that led them to the situation they find themselves in right now, so Donara explains that they were riding the bus like they would any other field trip day, but as they went through a tunnel, they found themselves in a sunny meadow. At first it was a pleasant yet confusing surprise, but then someone boarded the bus and introduced themselves as the sage Sheehan. She seemed nice enough at first glance, but as the teacher asks the reasonable question of what's going on, she boons his head off without hesitation. She tells everyone that she doesn't intend to harm anyone directly, but if they make her angry, they can fuck around and find out. She tries to make a joke, but it is so spectacularly unfunny that she freaking kills the driver for her own lack of a sense of humor. She explains to the rest of the students that she ezekated them all here to become sages. This world is ruled by sages but it is occasionally necessary to replenish the number of sages, which is why they were summoned here. She waves her hands and causes a majority of the students to begin glowing as she installs a system in their bodies called Battle Song. It comes with a status window, but Donora didn't get one, so she isn't sure what it looks like. Shin goes on to say that they have been given what this world calls gifts, so they are going to have to use those gifts well to become sages in the near future. Also, they only got one month to become sages, otherwise they die. Donora raises her hand and asks what happened because she didn't get one of those gifts, but Sheehan just says that there are times when people aren't suited to receive the magical gifts, so in other words, tough luck kid, you're screwed. Without a gift, she's doomed to become nothing more than livestock in this world, so with that out of the way, she tells them all that their first quest will be starting soon where a dragon will be attacking them, so they should try their best not to die. Donora's friend is looking over her menu screen and sees information about the dragon that will be attacking soon, but Donora still can't believe an actual dragon is going to attack. One member of their class gets the attention of the others and asks that they all work together so they can clear the mission, and to do that, they are going to need to know what they are working with, so he asks that they all reveal the gifts that they were given. The class comply with his request and write down their abilities to formulate a plan, but Donora, who doesn't have an ability, can't participate. However, she wasn't the only one who didn't get an ability since there were three others who had the same thing happen to them. Ayaka Shinazaki and Yuichiro Kiryu. And then there is also Yaguri, who managed to sleep through the entire commotion undisturbed, but then again, it's not like he ever did anything other than sleep in the first place. A while later, the rest of the gifted classmates who were sharing their ability list begin to leave without saying a word to any of the people in the back who didn't receive one. So Donora tries to wake Yogiri up so they can follow the rest of the class as they exit the bus, but the one who led them the gifted class stops Kiryu. He tells him that he didn't receive a gift, and while those who did have gained some kind of special ability that allows them to do things like rip a chair out of the ground with ease, the rest of the class are just regular people who are still failing peak class. 
Shinozaki asks the gifted class to protect the ones without gifts since they have the power to do so. But the guy thinks it would only become a burden for the class if they had to protect people who were so weak the entire time they were trying to become sages. Thus, they came up with an ingenious plan. They are gonna ditch them all here and use them as bait. Everyone in the class agreed to do this to them. So there is no one to appeal to for help. Another one of their classmates uses her ability to cast charm on the giftless classmates, making them all look far more attractive than they were before. But unfortunately, they are going to match with that dragon and it's not going to be a pleasant experience for them. The rest of the class leaves them to their fate and they have no idea what they are going to do. But things only get worse for them as the dragon arrived and began the slaughter. And that leads us to where we are now, though someone was peacefully sleeping in the back of the bus while his classmates were getting slaughtered. Yokari now understands the gravity of his situation, he is in another world, so how is he supposed to charge his video game without any outlets available? Aside from that, if what they learn from the gifted class is to be believed, then there is likely only one dragon in the area, so it should be safe for them to head outside now since it is already dead. Before they go, Donara asks Yokiri if he did something to the dragon earlier, but he just says he told it to die and it died. She doesn't believe him, but that's what he did, so he just steps out of the bus. There are three options for places they can go to after this, a hill, the city, or the forest, but it's probably a good idea not to go into an unknown forest unprepared. Before a decision can be made, Donora notices something flying towards them. Yokiri asks if it is another dragon, but this time is three of their classmates, Hikishida, Fukuhara, and Hanakawa. She's surprised to see them flying in, so Yokiri asks if he should kill them, just in case. Donora stops him since they should at least hear them out before they murder anyone, but Yokiri points out that leaving the giftless behind to be killed isn't something a good person would do. Donora still doesn't want to have to kill anyone, but even if she doesn't hold a grudge against them, they may still be hostile towards them for no reason. The three gifted students are shocked to see that the dragon is dead and moreover, Donara is still alive. Their plan was to use their powers to turn her body into a zombie and, well, do demonetizable things to her. And they say all of this right in earshot of Donara herself, so she realizes Yogiri may have been right about them not being good people and is suddenly much less opposed to killing them. Hikashida launches a fireball which is powerful enough to melt straight through the bus and carve into a mountain behind them, all to show the power difference between them and force Donura into giving up and becoming their plaything. Higashida says that he decided in this world that he would do anything he wants, and the first thing on that list is to screw Donura along with the other two guys who say they've been dreaming about this for a long time. Donura is freaked out by the thought of what they would do to her. But Yokiri tells her to calm down while he puts them in a situation where they can have a civil discussion. He then points at Higashida and tells him to die. The others laugh thinking Yogiri is just being cringy. But to their utter shock, he actually does fall to the ground and die. They don't understand what happened, but Yokiri told him to die and he did. Nothing much to explain there. He tells them not to move, but the other one drops to his knees to help his friend and as a result, Yokiri tells him to die as well. Hanakawa is now the only one left and Yokiri reiterates that if he moves at all, you'll be killed. Yokiri now begins to explain his ability, but first he instructs Hanakawa to check to make sure those guys are actually dead, so he goes to them and starts trying to heal them. His healing ability allows him to help anyone recover from injuries, no matter how grave they are, but his powers do nothing here because the people he's trying to heal are already dead. Hanakawa starts saying Yokiri went too far with this, but they were the ones who came in here trying to kidnap Donura for loot purposes. Yokiri's ability is instant death to any target, so if he simply thinks about wanting to kill someone, they will immediately die without exception. Hanakawa can't believe what he is hearing since that power is way too broken, but he tries to play it off and get in close for a sneak attack. However, Yokiri stops him before he can do anything stupid and informs him that he also has the ability to determine if there is anything killing intent directed towards him. So when you combine the two abilities, literally anyone who has the intent of killing Yogiri may die just because they thought about harming him. Hanakawa breaks down, realizing that there is no way he can win against Yogiri, but Yogiri asks why he got so full of himself after having just received his gift, so Hanakawa explains that this isn't the first time that they have come to this world. A while ago, the magicians of the Kingdom of Imen summoned them to defeat the Demon Lord, but the gist of it is that they went on adventures in this world for about a year, and once they finally defeated the Demon Lord, they were returned to Earth. The Elven can't seem to remember those three ever disappearing for an entire year. According to Hanakawa, after they were returned to Earth, they found out that only a few hours has passed since they were initially summoned, so Yogiri takes that to mean that there is a way for them to return to Earth. He raised his hand to finish off Hanakawa to prevent any future issues with him, 
but he begs to be spared by Yokiri. He tries to get Demura to help him out here, but after what he said when he initially came here, she is the last person who would ever want to do him a favor. As a last resort, Hanako pulls out a rare slave collar item which will make the wearer unable to disobey the commands of the first person they see. He puts the collar on and is now bound to the will of Danura but she doesn't want to have to deal with him, so she offloads the task of being his master onto Yokiri. Since Hanakawa can't disobey his orders now, Yokiri decides to leave him alive for a while, but he tells him to go stand in the forest full of magical beasts and wait. He also tells him to leave behind any valuable items that he has, so Hanakawa is forced to drop his entire inventory worth of loot from his last summoning. Danura asks if he may be being a little too harsh and taking all of his stuff away and making him wait in a deadly forest, but they aren't exactly friends and there is no telling when he might betray them in the end. Danura then asks why he is sticking with her since she could also betray him at some point, but if it happens then it happens, he is fine with it, since he is the one who chose to trust her. Danura blushes a little and asks why he is going through such lengths to protect her even though they have basically never spoken to each other before, but he doesn't really know. If you had to think of a reason, then it would probably be because of her melons though. She gets red in the face from embarrassment and yells about him only wanting her for her body as well, but elsewhere. Sheen is in bed and very pleased with herself, when someone called Yuchi comes in to give her a report on the students she summoned. They'd have cleared the first mission, but there were four fatalities in the process. Sheen assumes the fatalities were from the students who weren't able to receive gifts, but while two of them did die, there were also two's ranked gift holders that died in the process. That's a big surprise, especially since they died without any warning, but Sheen doesn't think it is anything that they really need to be worried about, so she tells Yuichi that he can handle it any way he sees fit. Yogiri and Donora finally make it to the city gates after several hours of walking, but they see the guards closing the gates as they approach. Yogiri expected as much since it is getting late, so they rush over to get their attention before they get locked out for the night. Donora goes up to one of the guards, but they can't understand a single word she is saying. The two get brought in and wait under a tent while the guards go get their boss to handle the situation, and after a few moments Masahito arrives annoyed that he still has to work so late into the night. He understands Japanese much to the relief of Don Nura, and he already seems to have an idea of what is going on here. The rest of their classmates came through town earlier that day so he has already dealt with them. Normally he would get charged a toll in order to enter the city, but he receives clear threats. I mean instructions from Shein not to get in the way of the sage candidates, so he won't be charging them today. Yogiri asks about the other sage candidates he mentioned coming through and recalls that they had mentioned something about going to the capital, so he asks which direction that would be, but while Masahito is not allowed to get in their way, there is no incentive for him to help them, so Yogiri gets up to leave. However, as they are passing, he hits a good look at Donora's assets and says he wouldn't mind it if Donora stayed in his mansion for the night, but only Donora. She doesn't seem interested and grabs Yogiri's hand to run away with a look of disgust on her face. She may not have liked the guy, but the reason she dragged Yogiri away so quickly was because she was afraid he would kill the guy for what he said. Yogiri doesn't know why she would think he is the kind of person to do something like that, but then again, he did kill his classmates back there for just moving, so it doesn't seem out of character for him. She moves on to another topic and talks about how amazing this town looks, it even has people that look like beast folk her, and speaking of beast folk, she gets approached by a cat girl called Miryu, who can tell that this is their first time in town. She asks if they might be in trouble or in need of any kind of help from her because if they are, she is there to assist with anything. She seems a little too friendly for someone they just met, so Yogiri asks what she stands to gain by helping them out here. She doesn't even try to hide it and says she just wants to get along with all the sage candidate boys because they are all down bad and dying of thirst. And as a cat girl, if the sage boys become successful in future, she can roll a nat 10 on seduction and live the easy life from then on. Danura doesn't agree with the thought process, but she can at least respect Maryu's honesty on the matter. Maryu goes on to say that Danura doesn't need to worry because she won't attempt seduction on anyone who already has a girlfriend. She is well aware of what Yandere girls are willing to do to keep their man, so she isn't going to risk it. Her seductive intentions aside, they don't see anything else shady about Maryu, and Danura wanted to take a look around town anyway before it gets too dark, so they decide to accept the cat girl's help. What's the worst that could happen? It's not like this is a trap or anything. Bulk, it was a trap. The two end up surrounded by a bunch of thieves after they spend the entire evening shopping in town. So Yogiri tries to de-escalate the situation by asking if they will accept money to leave them alone. The thieves agree that money would be nice, but what they are really after is talentless sage candidates like Yogiri and Danura. Whenever Shin goes and summons a bunch of sage candidates, 
the ones with good gifts often end up going wild with their power. And the thieves have gotten sick of all the dragon ball fights happening in their backyards and bringing down the property value. However, they are weak as shit compared to the gift bearers, so it's not like they can complain about it either. So they do this instead and go after the weak sage candidates to make themselves feel better. They plan to kill Yogiri and then make use of Dunner as irresistible assets, but now that he has clear grasp on their intentions and has failed to de-escalate, Yogiri is going to have to make a call to the local mortician. Donara tries to get Mariyu to call it off because someone is definitely going to die here and it's not going to be Yogiri. But she thinks they are just bluffing because there is no way someone without a gift could be so powerful in this world. Donara has done her best to save them, but it's time to make that call. First, we're gonna need five coffins for the people behind Yogiri, but he tries to take it easy on the rest of the people there. So he tells this guy to just half die, essentially turning him into a vegetable. That was still a little extreme, he tries going for individual body parts instead, but that is still pretty bad regardless. I know he was trying to take it easy on them, but at this point, it looks more like he is just torturing them. So he decides to just put an end to this. Mariu realizes that she fricked up big time and tries to beg for her life with her sob story of meaning to make money to help her sick brother. But to that, Yogiri raises the point. You tried to kidnap and sell us into slavery. She isn't going to be getting a redemption arc either as Yogiri is ready to put an end to this and tells both her and the last guy to just die. However, this time nothing happens and they thank the heavens that they are still alive, but they aren't going to stick around for Yogiri to try again, so they both make a run for it. Danara asks him why he chose to let them go, but he didn't. His kill success rate is always 100%. So just when Mariu thought she was a safe distance away, the death kicked in and believe it or not, she dies. Oh yeah, this guy ends up dying too, but no one really cares about him anyway. With all the attackers dead, Yogiri and Danara begin to walk off, however, they are called back by the city's guards who got news of the abnormally high number of coffins requested from the mortician. So they want to have a little chat with him about what just happened. Yogiri tries to lie his way out of this and just says that he found these guys on the floor already, but the guard isn't falling for his excellent deception tactics because she saw the whole thing. Those guys suddenly fell dead just before they could attack. Donara can't believe Adelgar is making them the suspects after they were the ones who got attacked first, and if she was watching the entire time, why didn't she do something to help when they were clearly in trouble? Adelgar makes the claim that she was just trying to clear find out who those guys are selling all their victims to, so they were going to let them kidnap Yogiri and Donara and just follow them until they found the guy they were looking for. She also tells them that the guards have received the sage's protection, so the gifts they have as sage candidates won't work on them, so they should just come quietly if they don't want any trouble. However, one of her men uses his appraisal ability on both and finds that neither of them actually possess any sage abilities, so they can't explain how Yogiri could have possibly managed to do this, and thus, they have no grounds to make an arrest. Adelbert admits defeat and tells them they are free to go, and Adelbert's subordinate apologizes for his commander's rudeness. Yogiri tells him it's fine, but as an apology, it would be nice if he could hook them up with a place to stay for the night. The man doesn't disappoint as Yogiri and Donora now have a really fancy inn to stay at. While Donora is still taking on the beauty of the place, Yogiri asks if she would like to share the same room with him while they are here. She finds that to be a bit embarrassing, so Yogiri offers to just have their rooms be next to each other. Donora gets to her room and marvels at the luxury it provides as she jumps on the huge bed. She starts thinking about Yogiri's initial request to share a room with her and wonders what kind of lewd things he must have been thinking about to ask for such a thing. Then again, this is literally the first time she's been away from Yogiri since they got to this world, and without him there to protect her, she would either be dead or enslaved thrice over. She wonders if Yogiri really likes her after all, but I think he already made it clear that he was specifically after those soft chest cushions of hers. While she squeezes her face into a pillow out of embarrassment, she hears a sound coming from the room and looks up to find a ghost floating over her bed. She's freaked out at first, but then she realizes that the ghost happens to look a lot like her sister. But her sister is still alive and must have done something really bad because this is actually their family guardian spirit and she makes it clear that she wants to have nothing to do with Donora's sister ever again. She is here to help Donora in her time of need since she is facing a very troubling series of events but if she wanted to help her, then why didn't she do it when the dragon attacked? Or maybe when she was almost sold into slavery twice in the same day? The guardian spirit, Moko, is an honest woman and tells her that she is scared to death by Yogiri. And that really tells you it's bad because she's already dead. With the kind of power Yogiri has, if she were to appear recklessly in front of him and make a bad impression, she could be erased from existence in an instant. So she wants Danura to tell Yogiri about her before she shows herself to him so he won't think of her as a threat. 
Donora says she'll tell him tomorrow, but then asks what kind of help Moko was going to give her. Moko explains that since she is a spirit, she can protect Donora from most things, aside from physical attacks. In fact, she was the one who prevented the Battle Song Sage gift from being installed into her body back on the bus. Donora gets angry because Moko basically put her at a permanent disadvantage in this world, but Moko doesn't see the problem since she thought Donora would have been opposed to a random person putting something suspicious inside her body. The Sage Gift certainly has its advantages, but once you allow it to be installed, then Sheen basically has control over you for the rest of your life, so it's not the best trade-off. Besides, it is Moko's goal to ensure that Donora returns to the Earth to become the successor of their family and martial arts technique. But while Donora certainly would like to go home, she's pretty much stuck just relying on Yogiri because she is so weak. But that's where Moko is going to work her magic as she will teach Donora all the centuries of fighting techniques she knows of. The next morning, Donora meets Yogiri downstairs after not getting any sleep the whole night because of Moko's midnight training arc. She asks Yogiri if they are going to meet up with the rest of their classmates after this and that is something he wanted to talk to her about. They both meet with a woman called Celestina, and she has been helping Yogiri by looking up the locations of all his classmates and how to get to them from here, as well as getting language translation and status concealment items for them. She even made him a charger for his game console, and got to say, Celestina is really earning that paycheck. She has also prepared two tickets for the both of them to reach the capital by train with a noon departure time. Yogiri thanks her for all her hard work, and if you were wondering how they've been paying for all the stuff they've gotten, they still have tons of gold they robbed from the three Returner students. Yogiri asks Celestina if she can take their leftover gold and do something like put it in investments for them. And she totally does it with no issues. The two move on to continue their journey to join up with the rest of their classmates and are heading toward the primal forest because Celestina thinks they will head there to train. But midway through the ride, Yogiri senses something and pushes Donora down to avoid a slash that destroys the entire train car. One of those Dragon Ball Sage fights is happening nearby and the collateral damage is really high. Elsewhere, one of this world's sages receives a report from Adelgart about the situation that occurred earlier, but they still don't know what happened since the guy who was still alive hasn't been able to give them an answer. This was the guy whose eyes Yogiri told to die, but they do not know about his ability, so they are confused and trying to figure out the cause. Even after ripping out one of the guy's eyes and using healing magic to grow a new one back in place, he still can't see. The sage then tries to use her vampire nature to turn him into one and give him regenerative powers, but that doesn't work either. Their experiments are cut short soon after as someone bursts through the wall with a sword in hand, but we'll get to that later as we head back to Yogiri and Donura who are still on the destroyed train. Yogiri can tell that they were not the intended targets for that attack, but it is still pretty dangerous for them to be here. It looks like a sage is attacking a robot that the people of this world call aggressors, and the battle is reshaping the landscape. Donora asks Yogiri if he can just kill them because they are in the way, but while Yogiri may be a killing machine, he still has rules that even he has to follow as well. He can't just go around killing people because they inconvenience him, and those guys didn't intentionally send the blast hits way, so there would be no reason to kill him. But then again, a sage seems to be a piece of shit, so Yogiri decides to kill him after all. Back with the vampire sage, the person that attacked has just blown away the entire castle, but with her innate healing ability, she was able to just tank the explosion. She did something terrible to this guy's lover, but once again, nobody cares about him. Plus, she's immortal so she doesn't even bother killing him and just chucks him off the roof. She then instructs Edelvart to find Yogiri since she wants to figure out how he managed to kill all those thieves. Meanwhile, after Yogiri killed the sage, the robot does the smart thing and tries to negotiate things peacefully rather than fight. But it doesn't have anything that Yogiri wants, so instead, Donora gets something. Later that day, the vampire sage holds a meeting with Sheehan over the dead sage they just found near the train tracks and she suspects that Yogiri might be behind this. Sheehan doesn't really care but leads her to do as she sees fit, so the vampire sage calls on one of her subordinates and tells him to get the zombie army ready. Back to Yogiri and Donara, after a ton of walking, they can finally see the city of Hanabusa which looks a lot like a Japanese city. While Donara is still all peppy and full of energy, Yogiri is absolutely wended after the long journey. Donora suggests that Yogiri start exercising more often, but the audacity of this bitch to say something like that after Yogiri just gave himself scoliosis from all the carrying he has been doing for the team. He's got a KD ratio that basically caused the extinction of the forest monsters and some bandits for good measure. After realizing she's been of no help at all this entire trip, she apologizes but asks that he tells her when they are in danger so she won't be acting so carefree and naive. 
Before they go, Donnera asks if his being tired after using his ability means he has a limit to how many times it can be used. But nope, he has no cooldown on it and the devs never patched it out, so he's free to spam instant death as much as he wants. They head into the city and are amazed by its futuristic appearance as they walk through its streets. They end up coming across a hotel that Celestina had suggested that they use, so they decide to head in and stay for a while before they do anything else. As they walk inside the hotel, they come across one of their classmates, Tachibana, who greet them normally like he didn't abandon them to their doom. Danara asks why he is here since, from what they know, he should still be with the rest of the class in the forest. He responds saying he split up from the rest of the group because he didn't agree with their inefficient methods of gaining levels. He had something much more beneficial for himself in mind, slavery. As soon as he got here, he learned that slaves were still a thing, so when asked how many he wanted, he said yes. These are the primary members of his harem, Erica, Stephanie, Chelsea, Euphemia, and Riza. These are quite the array of different girls, but they all have one thing in common for now, they hate Danura. Tachibana tells them to shut up for a bit while he talks to his classmates, and while he does that, Yokiri tells Danura that he seems really confident, so he must have a strong ability of some kind. They still don't know what his ability is, but he has been like that since he was in high school. He had the ladies flocking to him, so he was always a bit of a narcissist, and he would switch girlfriends more often than Amazon goes through employees. Tachibana speaks up and says that since they've met here by chance, then would Donura like to become his slave, I mean lover? She's petrified by the absurdity of his statement, but he assures her that it is fine since if she is worried about what will happen to Yogiri. While he usually doesn't swing that way, he'll make an exception for Yogiri as well. Neither of them can believe the shit they are hearing, so they ask what makes him so confident to make a request like that, and Tachibana reveals that he has the class of Dominator, meaning he is able to absolutely dominate any weaker beings. That is a pretty powerful ability, but if Tachibana is here, how does he intend to get stronger if all the others are busy training while he's lounging around here? But that isn't much of a problem for him since his ability is also broken. He explains that after the class had safely made it to the town and were celebrating, he was approached by one of his classmates, Utori, who told him about the true nature of his ability. Utori has the class of consultant, so he came to give Tachibana some insight on what he should do from now on. Right now in the class, everyone is avoiding him because of his class of dominator, and Utori doesn't want to fight to break out among them. So he informs Tachibana that the true power behind his ability is a pyramid scheme. He can go buy a bunch of cheap slaves and make them go out and fight for him. Then if the slaves win, he gets experience and can make the defeated people become his slaves as well, so his network of slavery will only keep on growing as time passes and his XP gain will be exponential. That's certainly useful information, but the menu screen didn't have any information like that, so he questions how Utori was able to figure this out. Utori revealed that his ability allows him to see the hidden details of anyone's ability, but that still doesn't answer the question of why is he giving a free consultation like this. As a consultant, his chances of successfully becoming a sage are tied to the success of his classmates, so he wants everyone to do the best they can do so they don't end up as livestock on the chopping block. That basically means that at this very moment, Tachibana's number of slaves is rising and he is gaining levels without meaning to do anything at all, so he re-extends the offer and asks Danura to become his slave, but she still likes having her freedom. Tachibana agrees to leave and says he will give her time to think about the proposal. At least he isn't being pushy about it, so he isn't much of a threat to them for now, but Yogiri points out that it might actually be safer for Donora if she were to go with him since she would be close to the top of the pyramid scheme, but that's still not an option. Three days pass and Yogiri has been asleep this entire time and Donora can't do anything by herself because she needs him to be there to carry the team. It has been peaceful this far, but not anymore as the zombie army has begun to invade the city. But once again, Yogiri isn't awake, so Donora just closes the curtains and chooses to ignore it. While she is laying on the bed, Mokomoko informs her that there is someone currently targeting her, but she isn't able to see them, so since she isn't built to handle threats at all, Donora grabs the phone to call Yogiri for help. Yogiri wakes up to the call for help, so he leaves his room to go save her life again. As he enters the hallway, he is able to scan and can sense some killing intent coming from someone, so he traces it back and kills the assailant, who happens to be Erika. He knocks on Danura's door to tell her there was actually someone targeting her, so now they got to discuss their next move. But first he makes a call to the local morgue for one more coffin. Tachibana was out in a dungeon when he noticed that Erika's signal suddenly stopped working, so something must have happened and on the other end, Yokiri realizes that Tachibana might come back for revenge since he killed one of his top slaves, so they had better leave soon. Meanwhile, Tachibana has just effortlessly cleared the hundredth floor of the dungeon with no trouble thanks to the skills of his servants, which he is able to use at will. 
and now that he is done with that, he decides to check on the situation with Erica suddenly dying. He looks through her memories and she just kind of fell over suddenly. He doesn't know what killed her, but Euphemia thinks she might have been jealous of Donura and tried to eliminate her, leading to what they saw happen. Tachibana doesn't really care about Erika, but he doesn't want Donura to leave without becoming his slave, so he takes a less diplomatic approach and has some of his other servants try to keep Donura from leaving. They get cornered by Riza who uses an ice spell to block off the hallway, but that doesn't stop Yogiri because he can just tell the ice to die and it does. He asserts dominance over Riza by killing her wand as well and tells her that he can kill anything just by thinking about it. So if she tries any funny business, she will die. She caves and tells him that she's a wand master, so she can attack without a wand, also giving him the wand that she kept stashed away in between her mounds. She was ordered to capture Danura, but that also means the other servants were given the same order and Danura nearly gets sneak attacked, but she's finally starting to pull her weight in the game and gets her first kill. Riza tries to use the distraction to get up and use her extra hidden wand, but that counts as funny business and Yogiri was clear what would happen if she tried that. Riza gets killed, leaving only the little girl and her dolls to attack them, but he just kills the dolls and goes down to finish off the girl. Chelsea is smart enough to know that she isn't winning this so she gives up and gives Yogiri all the info that he wants. Since Chelsea made the smart choice to snitch on Tachibana, he was left with no other option than to use his last resort, his cockroach army. They may just be cockroaches, but with this many of them in one place, if Tachibana gave the order for them all to attack at once, then they could probably end up killing a human. For instance, they could crawl into your mouth and nose and squirm around in your throat until you suffocate to death. But now that we've got enough nightmare fuel for the day, we see Euphemia telling Tachibana that it might not be a good idea to attack someone who claims to be able to kill anybody, but Tachibana isn't backing down because he is a dominator, so if he doesn't kill Yogiri, he won't be the main character. He orders the cockroaches to begin their attack, but as soon as the killing intent reaches Yogiri, he was able to trace it back to Tachibana and kill him on the spot. Now that Tachibana is dead, the cockroaches won't attack them anymore, but it still is a room full of cockroaches, so they don't stay there for too long. Meanwhile, Stephanie and Euphemia are left with Tachibana's dead body, so having regained her freedom, Euphemia just dips. However, as she comes up to the surface, she is met by a wasteland, where a forest once was and a giant glob of darkness that had just passed through the area. The vampire sage is also there to get information about the situation. She bites Euphemia and turns her into a vampire so she will tell her everything that has happened. Meanwhile, Danara and Yogiri finally make it out onto the streets, but remember that thing about the zombie army that Danara ignored? Yeah, looks like that's a problem now. Back with the vampire sage after turning Euphemia into a member of her bloodline, she asks about Yogiri's ability since Euphemia, must have seen at least some amount of what Yogiri is capable of doing. If his ability is really able to cause death to any target he wishes, then she is curious to see if it can put an end to her immortal life. In the city under siege, people are running around in a panic as they get first-hand experience on what a zombie apocalypse feels like, all the while, Yogiri and Donora are hiding in an alleyway and planning their next move. The zombies are pretty slow, so Yogiri believes they could probably make it out of the city if they are careful not to get themselves cornered. Danara asks if he really intends to just leave the people of the city as things are right now, but he never signed up to be a hero in this world. He made it clear at the start all he cares about are Danara's fun bags, so she's the only person he feels inclined to protect. Meanwhile, the mayor of the town is outraged that the Unden army's leader, Masayuki, showed up to his town unannounced and is laying waste to his people unprovoked. The vampire sage, Lady Lane, personally gave him control over this area, so Masayuki has no right to come in here and destroy it. Masayuki tells Ryota to calm down after all, they were both once comrades and sage candidates. They both survived the same battlefield together, or at least Ryota did since Masayuki died and got revived as an undead. Getting back to the point, Ryota tells Masayuki to take his undead army and get out of his city immediately, but Masayuki has all the permission he needs from Lady Lane herself. So there's nothing anyone can do to stop him since he has literally been given a license to kill as many people as necessary to find Yogiri. Hearing that this was under the orders of Lady Lane, Ryota is forced to concede and hand over the key to the city so Masayuki can get on with his plans. He takes control of the speakers placed all around the city and commands all the zombies to stop attacking for now. He then gives the people an ultimatum. He is looking for a boy named Yogiri and a girl named Danura, so the people of the city have one hour to bring them to him, dead or alive. And if they fail, they'll be the ones who end up dead. He's already made sure that no one can escape by locking the gates to the city, so if the people want to survive, then they have to get their asses in gear and start hunting down the teenagers. 
Ryota isn't happy that his citizens are being treated as pawns in Masayuki's game of cat and mouse, but again nothing can be done because boss lady said so. Now the people on the street are running around like crazy looking for Yogiri and Donura, and they are frankly more frightening than the zombies were. Donura doesn't even get why they would be getting chased to this extent in the first place, but there was that whole thing when Yogiri killed one of the sages. That was probably a pretty big deal. Recklessly killing people may end up causing them more problems in the future. But just as he says this, three people pull up behind him and are prepared to end his life in order to capture him. Yogiri gives a warning saying that he will not hesitate to kill anyone who attacks him. But this chunky guy pays no need to this warning and attacks anyway. And as expected, another coffin now needs to be purchased. The other two guys get cold feet after seeing their friend get killed so easily and run away, and Yogiri is left wondering why Masayuki would think the citizens would be of any use in capturing him as it has already been established that he can kill anybody without much difficulty. Then again, Masayuki might have been hoping that Yogiri would have some kind of moral code against killing civilians or something, but Yogiri has no such weaknesses. Still, he doesn't particularly like the idea of having civilians thrown at him like meat puppets, so he decides that it might be a good idea to go negotiate with Masayuki personally. The two head to the town square to meet with Masayuki, and the place simply reeks of death and decay. They get to Masayuki and he is pretty disappointed that he didn't get the chance to kill more citizens before Yogiri turned himself in. Masayuki asks if he intends to sacrifice himself for the sake of the citizens of the city, but he has come to do no such thing. Masayuki doesn't think Yogiri has much of a choice in the matter, though since he is the one holding the power here, but Yogiri has come to bargain. He wants to use the train to get out of the city, so he would like Masayuki to get rid of the barrier around the city. Masayuki becomes vain, throbbingly enraged and tells Yogiri that he is in no position to be asking for favors right now. Yogiri concedes and agrees to sweeten the deal by letting him live even though he is a bastard, However, Masayuki can't recognize how lucky he is to receive such a great deal and orders his undead army to kill Yogiri. He believes his army should be immune to whatever kind of death magic Yogiri possesses since they are already dead. But Yogiri just tells them all to die, and even though I don't know how it's possible, they all die again, and this time for good. The smile on Masayuki's face fades as he starts to wish he had taken Yogiri's initial offer. His immortal army has been defeated in an instant, and not wanting to be next in line, Ryota throws his hands up and sells Masayuki out. Masayuki isn't even mad that Ryota is ditching him. But what he wants to know is how something that is already dead could possibly be killed. It's all simple really, you say they are dead, but they were still moving, so Yogiri considers them to still be alive. And if that doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't matter, because this is Yogiri's show, and he gets to decide what dead means. Masayuki can't stand for such absurdity and begins to transform so he can fight Yogiri at full power, however, Yogiri doesn't play by the rules and just kills him before he can finish transforming. There's still the problem of needing to take down the barrier around the city, but that shouldn't be a problem as Ryota seems more than happy to do whatever Yogiri asks of him. He pleads with Yogiri to spare his life, but Yogiri never intended to kill him anyway as he only ever kills in self-defense. Ryota explains that Masayuki was ordered by the vampire sage Lane to kill Yogiri. The city and the surrounding area are controlled by Lane, so as her subordinate, he was put in charge of looking after the city. That's a bit confusing to them since they got called here by Sign to become sages, and now they are being hunted down by another sage. Just then, Mokomoko appears and informs the two that some spiritual manipulation was targeted at this area, and all of a sudden, all the citizens of the city now have killing intent directed towards Yogiri and Danura. If it is a spiritual attack that is making the citizens act up like this, then maybe the barrier could block it out, but as Ryota tries to use the key to change the barrier settings, he finds that he has been locked out of the controls. Which could only possibly mean that Lane has taken it over, and is the one behind this. From a great distance away, Lane is carrying out her plan, but Euphemia tells her that what she's doing is really risky. Lane already knows that Yogiri was able to kill Tachibana over a long distance by tracing his control of the cockroaches, and with power like that, he is already far above the power of any sage. That is exactly why Euphemia believes they should just let him do his thing and step aside. The mind-controlled people begin attacking Yogiri one by one, and he is forced to continuously kill them as they attack. He has had something like this happen to him before where one guy tried a bunch of things just to see how Yogiri would react to them, but in the end he can always just kill them all if it comes down to it. Ryota is having a really hard time seeing all of his precious citizens dropping like flies right in front of his eyes. Meanwhile, Lane is still doing her thing outside the city, 
And as that darkness monster from before is approaching, it works out in her favor because now she can cause Yogiri's death without any direct killing intent against him. She decides now is a good time to put her backup plan into action and duplicates her body several times in the sky. In the city, the darkness has arrived within the city borders, and it is turning everything that it comes in contact with into sand, and it's heading straight for them. At the same time, Lane explains that she created her clones with all the information about Yogiri being removed from their brains, so with no knowledge of who Yogiri is, there should be no way for them to hold any hostility towards him, and thus he shouldn't be able to kill them. She decides to use the darkness as a cue to begin her attack, so she orders the clones to carpet bomb the city once the darkness dies as she expects Yogiri to be able to kill it. In the city, the people watch in horror as the darkness tears through the architecture and leaves nothing but dust in its wake. They believe there is nothing anyone can do to stop it, but Yogiri could definitely do something if he wanted to. He has a bad feeling about this, but at the same time he can't leave that thing to just kill everyone, so he decides to kill it. After the darkness is killed, Lane's carpet bombing strategy takes effect and more destruction rains down upon the city. Yogiri can see the attack, but he can't sense any hostility, almost as though something is just attacking the city indiscriminately. This must be the work of whoever was testing him with the civilians, but while Yogiri was having this intense tactical analysis, he was buried face deep in Donora's voluptuous buns. This reminds him what he is fighting for, so he gets up to solve the problem, but that's easier said than done since he doesn't know where the attacks are coming from. Donora looks up and she sees something she could never have expected, the bombs that are hitting the city are literally all the clones of Lane yoloing themselves into the ground. They realize that this is Lane's countermeasure against Yogiri's instant death, and he can't really do much about it since she isn't targeting him. And the copies are blowing themselves up so fast that he can even see them. In that case, if all he needs is to be targeted, then Ryota thinks he can help. His ability class is a mayor, so he is able to see everything in the town at once and uses the information he has access to find out the next place that will get drone striked. He then teleports them all there, and as the clone is about to hit them, Yokiri makes it die before prompting Mokomoko to use her guardian spirit jazz to make a shield around them. The shield was some protective plating that can be worn under clothing, but thanks to Mokomoko's guardian spirit thing, she is able to turn it into anything from a shield to a suit of armor. Finally, now Donora isn't dead weight anymore. All Lane's clones have been defeated and Euphemia is telling her that she fucked up when she decided to go after Yogiri, but she still doesn't see the problem since she can just create more clones to attack again. Just then, the full scope of the instant death hits and Lane realizes, oh shit, I really fucked up. Still, she did want to die anyway. Elsewhere, a little girl wakes up from a nap in a coffin and receives a pre-recorded message from Lane, telling her that she is a copy of her that was made to be its own separate person. This was done to avoid attacks from Yogiri, but we'll get back to that later as Yogiri and Donora are about to set off from the city now that they've received some transportation from Ryota. Meanwhile, we finally get to see what the other students have been up to as we meet Ryuko, who is a samurai class. After defeating a monster, she enters her tent where a girl called Carol is standing. Carol stole Ryuko's phone because she wanted to get a look at the app she had for monitoring Yogiri. It seems they were both tasked with spying on him back on Earth, but as they check the monitor, they are greeted with horrifying news. Yogiri's first gate is open. Donora has been put in charge of driving the jeep, but from the way they nearly died right there, it is clear that she doesn't know a damn thing about driving. So she wants to switch with Yogiri. But he's already fast asleep, so it looks like she's on her own for this one. Since she wasn't paying attention, Donora is about to crash into a boulder on the road, while Yogiri is having a wonderful dream involving this woman. We get a little backstory of who this woman is and she is seen signing a contract for a job interview. She finds it a little concerning that there's a death waiver involved, but she's in too deep to back out now and those bills aren't going to pay themselves so she goes along with it. She asks if this is some kind of evil organization, but her employer assures her that everything that goes on here is mostly legal, but he does sound very convincing. He tells her that this facility researches curses, so her job will be to take care of a monster. She is led down a creepy red hallway and asks where they are heading, so the employer informs her that she is tasked with looking after a being whom they have dubbed Alpha Omega. From the description given, Asaka wonders if it might be a human, but the employer doesn't really know as he has never risked seeing the thing for himself. Alpha Omega has the frightening ability to kill anything just by thinking about it, so they brought in Asaka to be its teacher. It's already dangerous enough as it is, but imagine a toddler with no sense of maybe I shouldn't kill people for fun, having that kind of power. That is where Asaka comes in, but if you're wondering why she was selected for this dangerous job, it's because she's the only one who showed up. They get to the bottom of the elevator, so the employer hands her a piece of paper and tells her you're on your own now before leaving her to deal with the being. 
She's got no other choice than to go in, but they shouldn't blame her if the world gets doomed because of something she did. She enters a room that has an artificial environment being generated and walks over to the house illustrated on the incredibly well-drawn map. Once there, she calls out to see if anyone is home and eventually comes across a little boy in the center room. She was anxious before, but now she's just enraged by the fact that the government locked up a child in this underground base. She's not going to stand around and let this kid become a neat, so she forcibly drags him outside and throws him into the creek so he can play for once. Yogiri looks stunned for a moment but then points his finger at Asaka and kills a monster that was hiding behind her. There's no concrete answer on what that thing was, but things like that show up from time to time and try to kill him. It probably got in by hiding in her shadow, but it's dead now, so there's no reason to be worried anymore. Yogiri speaks up and says he would love to play, but it's getting really late now, so it would be better if they did that tomorrow. Asaka realizes she may have gotten a little carried away and apologizes before finally introducing herself to him. But more importantly, Yogiri tells her he's hungry and it finally sets in that she is the adult in the room, so she's got to cook. In the kitchen, there is a fully stocked pantry, but all that is useless if you've got no cooking skills. She really needs to get something ready before Yogiri gets out of the bath though, so she goes for the broke college student classic, a cup of ramen. Luckily for her, Yogiri has never tasted this before so he is really happy with his dinner, and while he eats, Asaka thinks of a name for him. She ultimately decided to name him after a dog, which was how he got the name, Yogiri. From this moment on, she took on the role of being his mother figure and taking care of him. These were fond memories for Yogiri, but he is woken up when Donnery yells that the road to the capital is blocked. She is surprised that he can sleep through her reckless driving, but he can't help it since he's tired from killing all those zombies back in the city. Besides, he doesn't even get why they need to head to the capital in the first place after all, their end goal is to get back to their original world, and to do that they are trying to find the Sage Shin. So even if they don't head to the capital, there should still be other ways available to locate her. With that in mind, they decide to turn around and find another way past this mountain. But as Donora is backing up, she accidentally rams into a dragon that was standing behind them. They get out to assess the situation, but the dragon attacks, leaving Yogiri with no choice but to kill the thing. However, that wasn't the only dragon as there was a whole flock of them. And they are all honed in and ready to blast them clean off the face of the earth with fire. Unfortunately for them, they were up against Yogiri. So moments later, they all dropped dead. They were forced to wipe out an entire population of dragons. But if you think about it, this is dragon territory so Yogiri just pulled up and committed mass genocide in their front lawn. However, things aren't over yet as a golden thunder dragon soon appears. However, the gold dragon doesn't seem to have any killing intent aimed at them, so Yogiri sees no reason to kill it. After a few moments, the dragon says they can pass and then tries to fly away in a hurry so it doesn't get killed. Since the dragon can talk, Yogiri calls it back under threat of being killed, and we are introduced to this little girl. Denura wonders why that huge dragon turned into this little girl, but don't let the details bother you. Right now, Yogiri asks the important question of why the dragons attacked him and Denura in the first place. The girl explains that they were trying to test if Yogiri was worthy of meeting the Swordmaster, but he has no idea who the Swordmaster is. The dragon can't believe they came all the way out here with no intention of meeting the master, but they just want to get to the capital, so there's no reason to take a detour now. The dragon pleads with them to follow her to the master since her job was to bring promising individuals to him, so she can't return empty-handed after losing her entire dragon army. The Swordmaster is supposedly on equal terms with a sage, so Yogiri agrees to meet him since he might have some clues on how they can return to their original world. Plus, they were kind of stuck here anyway, so the dragon promises that if they come with her to meet the Sword Master, then she will personally take them to the capital. She introduces herself as Attila and guides them to the location of the Sword Master. When they arrive, they find a lot of people standing around as they are also here to meet the Sword Master and have a chance at becoming the next Divine King. One of the guys there thinks it must be against the rules to come here by car since everyone else had to walk, but the Sword Master himself says he has no problem with it. You may think the Sword Master is a nice guy, but you'd be wrong as the first order of business after he arrives is for everyone to kill each other until there are less than half remaining. Yogeri didn't even want to come here in the first place, so he asks if he can just go since he isn't going to participate. Thus, the Sword Master makes up a rule that no one is allowed to escape. The bloodshed begins as the participants begin killing each other, and as some people begin to target him, Yogiri sees no choice other than to kill him. But this time, he doesn't need to as someone steps in to protect him and Donura from danger. This guy seems to actually be pretty decent, but he is glazing the Swordmaster way too much. 
He says there is no way the Swordmaster would ever actually want them to kill one another, so it must have just been a test to see if they would act dishonorably, just because he said so. However, the man definitely just wanted to see some of them die. Yonkiri notices some magicians casting an ominous spell in the background, so he kills them, and the good knight continues the glazing saying the Swordmaster must have killed them for not acting honorably. They also noticed this guy who was cosplaying as Gojo the bisected one but he's still alive and kicking, so he asks Inura to put that rainbow colored stone in his hand. She's freaked out but does as he says and as he holds the gem, he returns to his unbisected body. The Swordmaster has had enough killing for one day, so he tells everyone to stop and follow him because he is continuing the test elsewhere. Attila pleads with Yogiri to keep going along with the trial because if he wins and becomes the next Divine King, then she will get a promotion and become his attendant. It's not like they have gotten any information yet, so they see no harm in continuing with the trial for the meantime. But this is getting more annoying than Yogiri would have hoped. They follow the Swordmaster and along the way, the knight who helped them introduces himself as Rick. The bisected one is called Lionel, and now that introductions are out of the way, Yogiri asks what the big deal is about becoming the Divine King. Rick explains that the Divine King was a person who sealed away the Dark God long ago. But even though the Dark God is sealed, it is still a threat as there are many people working to revive him. Meanwhile, in the back, Dunora asks Lionel what that stone was that healed him. He explains that these are apologems that can heal serious injuries and also be used for gacha games. He has always had terrible luck since he was born so he would always end up in terrible situations and more recently, he ended up getting sacrificed by a weird cult. He thought he was dead for sure, but then a goddess appeared and went damn sorry dude, giving him apology gems to make up for his terrible life. Aside from injuries, he can also trade the gems for random items, but with his bad luck, he ends up just getting a brush. He used up most of his crystals on that one, but he gets new ones every midnight depending on how bad his luck for the day was. The rest of the group disappears into a barrier, and as they follow, they find themselves before a huge tower. Attila seems to have been left behind due to the barrier, so it seems like only those that are participating in the trial can enter. They enter the tower and head up to the top where the Sword Master shows them the seal created by the last Divine King holding hundreds of monsters and the Dark God. Donora can see a girl in the middle stabbing herself along with the Dark God. One other participant, Frederica, tries to launch an attack at the Dark God to kill it once and for all. But the barrier slows down time, so it may take hundreds of years for the attack to finally reach and one piece might have ended by then. The goal for the night selection exam is for them to accumulate 100 points before they get to the ground, and they can't cheat by jumping off the side of the tower either. Donora wonders if Yogiri's power would work on the Dark God even with the time delay, but he looks like he feels guilty about something. He usually has a rule about not killing things unless he has a reason to do so, but Yogiri was feeling a little off from all the miasma that was in the area, so he wanted to see if he could find the source and get rid of it, meaning he already killed the Dark Lord in the time bubble. Now that they basically made this whole test pointless by killing the Dark Lord, Yogiri wants to get out of here before anyone figures out what he has done, but before they leave, Lionel hears his name called out by the entitled bitch that dragged him into this competition in the first place. She is demanding that he hand over some of his apologems so she can replenish her mana before the test begins, and he complies but tells her that the apologems do not work for anyone other than him. She leaves Lionel behind, and after picking up his gem, the team can finally get moving. Thankfully, since they were delayed, the people who went ahead have kindly and involuntarily showcased all the traps that were set in the tower, so now their job should be much easier since they just have to avoid triggering the remaining traps in the tower. It shouldn't be too hard, but then again, they've got Lenel and their team, and immediately after Rick had warned everyone to be careful, he steps on a magic circle and gets his chest impaled. Thankfully, he still has some crystals left so he is able to recover from the severe damage he just took, and since this keeps happening so often, Donora suggests that he just keeps one crystal in his hand at all times. Now confident that he should be safe, he goes running into an unexplored room by himself. And for the sound of the blood-curdling scream coming from him, I don't think he is having a good time in there. Rick runs in after him and finds a woman called Teresa standing in the middle of the blood-covered room. Rick can't believe she would do something like this, since she is meant to be one of the Knights of the Divine King, but this is well within what she would usually do, especially since this is how you're supposed to gain points in this tower. In fact, she ended up killing so many people just for the hell of it that she got her title as a knight stripped from her. So since she is currently unemployed, she decided to try her hand at becoming the Divine King as well, and it's a little bonus that she gets to kill as many people as she likes. Rick tells the others to get out of here as soon as possible, but Donora tells him they can't move because there are currently dozens of things wires strung up all across the room. Teresa is impressed she managed to figure that out before they could fall for the trap, but regardless, that won't save them. 
Rick puts himself in the front line and tells the others that he will keep Teresa at bay while they find a way to get out of here. However, Teresa has no intention of letting any of them get out of here alive as she starts striking at Rick with her threads. She is definitely a strong opponent and Rick is doing well to keep up with her attacks thus far, however, Donara can tell that Teresa is still holding back so if she gets serious, he may be unable to handle her. However, it's never going to come to that as Yogiri tells her to die, and Teresa is immediately on her way to the afterlife. Now that she's dead, they remember they had a guy named Linnell with them, and Yogiri finds his severed hand on the ground. Pretty unlucky that he got his hand with a crystal chopped off, but at least he is still alive. The group head down and have now made it to the 98th floor of the tower, and they are informed that this place counts as a safe zone. So they are free to rest while they are here, and there are even rooms provided for them. Yogiri suggests that since this place is safe, they can split up and do their own things for a while. Rick is okay with splitting up, but he asks if Yogiri and Donora will be alright by themselves. They say they are fine and Lenel agrees as well since he has run out of apologems for the day, and if he leaves this place without one, he may die for real this time. Since everyone is in agreement, Rick says he will be going on ahead, and Lionel gets a room so he can barricade himself for survival. Yogiri asks Donora if she would like to rest for a while, but unfortunately, there is currently only one room available in this safe zone. And you know what that means. Donora gets nervous and reminds Yogiri that Mokomoko is still here and she will be able to see if anything happens, but Mokomoko says she's okay with the prospect of a grandchild. Yogiri wastes no time in taking off his clothes, but I don't know what you were thinking because he just wanted to change and go to sleep. Meanwhile, Midmag has finally come, so after nearly dying 15 times today, Lionel receives his next batch of apologems and gets a great deal on them as well. He received 100 apologems and a guaranteed ultra-rare gasha. He is excited and goes for the gasha pull immediately, but instead of a weapon or armor of some sort, he gives a woman. This is the goddess that brought him to this world, but she's not here to join him in his adventures or anything, she just wanted to pop in and see if he is still alive. She also tells him that she updated his save point, so now, no matter how many times he dies, he will always respawn here. She then disconnects from the body and vanishes. Meanwhile, in the tower control center, the homunculus girl informs the master that there is a problem. From her calculations, the number of souls that the tower has collected doesn't match the number of people that have died, but he doesn't see it as that big of an issue since they still have more than enough souls available to run the barrier. Another point of concern is that they will also need to replenish their stock of half-demons who are powering the barrier. Elsewhere, we see a blue-haired girl running through a field with explosions happening around her. She points out that it is rude to attack someone on sight when you don't even know what they want yet, but the guy is already well aware that she is here to recruit him. The girl was indeed asked to recruit him and was given orders to kill anyone who refused to join. So she makes sure she has the right person by scanning him with her eye. The guy is called Seitu, and he used his gift to build this colony and live a peaceful life here. And he doesn't want that messed up by Awa, so he uses his power to attack her with a bunch of tentacles. Unfortunately for him, Aoi has hacks built in. Since none of his abilities are working, Seitu takes out his sword which has a high luck stat on it, so her ability can't affect it. But that just means she has to avoid getting hit by Seitu's sword, and she does so quite effortlessly before holding him at knife point and slitting his throat. She then gets a message from her talking knife, informing Ho that she has got another job to complete and needs to head to the city of Hanabusa in order to take out Yogiri. She's annoyed that she doesn't even get to catch her breath, but starts heading out to complete the mission. But before she goes, a face I never thought I'd see again shows up. Hanakawa somehow managed to survive in the forest for a while, and he was eventually saved by Seiku who took him in and let him live in his barony. However, now that Aoi has killed him, there's no one left to protect this place, so he desperately wants to go with her. Back to Yogiri and Donora. Donora was still sleeping when Mokomoko started calling for her to wake up. She opens her eyes and finds Yogiri's face first in them titties, although it's not like he did it intentionally since he is still asleep. Besides, that wasn't the reason Mokomoko woke her up, it was because she is stuck in the wall. She was watching them sleep earlier when Yogiri started hugging Donora in his sleep. And thinking some spicy action was about to take place, she went into the wall so she wouldn't be interrupting anything. But then she got curious to see if they had gotten busy yet, so she tried to take a peek, and then this happened. It seems like the tower has a mechanism to capture spirits, so she is slowly getting sucked into the wall. Yogiri finally wakes up and she asks if he can do anything to save her. But Donora has already given up and thanks Mokomoko for all the time they spent together. Since the wall is sucking her in, Yogiri walks up to it and locates the mechanism doing the sucking. Then he makes it die, which works for some reason. 
Mokomoko is glad she managed to survive, even though she's been dead for centuries by now, but she still wonders what the reason behind the tower sucking up souls could be. Yogiri isn't sure, but with all that has happened, he tells Daonura that she's going to have to make sure she is ready because he's going to kill anybody that even remotely seems like a threat from this point onward. She already knew they would need to kill people that try to kill them, and she's thankful to Yogiri for always protecting her. And she got Yogiri blushing really harder from what she just said to him. Elsewhere, always approaching Yogiri and the others in the tower, but they run into the dragon and Hanako thinks they should run away, but she doesn't think it's such a big deal and just says, I don't think a dragon's that bug should be able to fly. And immediately after, the dragon falls to the ground. Her ability doesn't simply cause a force nat one roll, it literally changes the world to be exactly as she believes it to be. So in other words, no matter how delusional she is, she is always right. But if her opponent has good luck, then she can't use it on them. The dragon is still a threat though, but it gets beheaded by an aggressor who gathers intel from it and then heads into the barrier. Oh decides to follow it and Hanakoa gets dragged along. Meanwhile, Yogiri and Danura continue to make their way through the tower by destroying the challenges, but the creator of the tower gets pissed and personally comes down to stop them. He says the tower was created to maintain the barrier and keep the Dark Lord sealed, so he can't have it be destroyed. Yogiri promises that if they let him and Danura out of the tower right now, then he won't destroy it anymore. But Iglesia isn't feeling very reasonable right now. He's about to threaten them, but Yogiri isn't going to wait that long and just kills him. They continue through the tower and find two swordsmen duking it out in a stadium. And a guy called Masaki sitting on a throne which he must have had to carry all the way here. The girl fighting the bunny is apparently a half-demon, but Yogiri doesn't want to get involved and just asks to get through the exit without a fuss. However, Masaki is too full of himself and refuses to let Yogiri go without a fight. While the demon girl doesn't really care what he does. Masaki calls out the rest of his servants to fight and starts explaining what they can do, but none of that is important because a few seconds later, Yogiri kills them all. Masaki tried to fight as well, so Yogiri took him out too. The demon girl recognizes the power Yogiri must have to be able to kill someone like Masaki so easily, so she requests that he let her join him. The girl introduces herself as Theodisia, a swordsman in disguise who infiltrated the tower trial in an attempt to locate her sister who had gone missing recently. She came here because she had heard her people were getting imprisoned in the tower, so she would like Yogiri's help in traversing it and locating her sister. However, helping her would mean going against the sword master, so she understands if they do not wish to go through with it. Up till this point, Yogiri and Daonura have basically been going through the tower by destroying it bit by bit. So if anything, they are already declaring themselves as enemies of the sword master even if they didn't want to. For that reason, he is fine with helping her out, but he tells her not to rely on his ability too much as he is just helping her look for her sister. Theo is very appreciative of his offer to help, but they got to have some kind of clue on where to search if they are going to start looking for her sister. She doesn't have much to go off of, but for some reason she can sense something underground, so that's the first place they'll look. Just then, they are joined by Rick, friend Erika, and Lionel, who has surprisingly managed to make it this far without dying. They all head to the next room where the sword master was waiting for them, so as he sees that 17 candidates have managed to make it through the trials, he is about to proclaim the next divine king, but before he can do that, he gets interrupted by the homuncule, who have come to deliver terrible news. The tower has fallen silent, almost as if someone told it to die so they are having trouble maintaining the first barrier, and the second barrier is largely unstable right now so there is no telling how long they have before the subjects of the Dark Lord are able to breach it. In that same instant, a bright light shines through the tower, and as everyone opens their eyes, they find that the tower has been completely destroyed along with the first barrier, but the second one is still barely functional. The Swordmaster draws his sword as the one behind this destruction descends upon the former tower. He had thought destroying the tower would get rid of the barrier as well, but it seems they are maintained by different systems. The Swordmaster knew this day would come, but he didn't expect it to be so soon. Still, now that things have come to this, he asks the candidates to help him defeat that thing. Otherwise, humanity is done for. While all this is going on, Yogiri suggests that they go search underground while everyone is busy with that thing, and Danara asks if he really isn't going to do anything about it, even though he can. But as a wise man once said, I missed the part where that's my problem. Besides, if he were to defeat that thing now, it would probably draw a lot of unwanted attention towards them. So it is far more convenient to just let other people do it instead. Lionel sees Yogiri and the others leave and thinks it might be a good idea to leave as well, but Rick stands his ground not wanting to turn tail and run from the enemy. The same goes for Fregarica, so they stay where they are and prepare for a fight. 
The Dark Angel comes down to the ground and demands to know how to disable the barrier that is holding the Dark Lord in. But the Sword Master refuses to give that information up so easily. The Dark Angel doesn't mind if he wishes to be stubborn about providing the information, he'll just stand here and kill them all one by one until someone feels like telling him what he wants to know. People begin dropping like flies as the Dark Angel electrocutes them. So the ninja in the group tried to stop him by charging forward and creating several shadow clones. However, the clones made no difference as the angel was still able to electrocute them all to death in an instant before he could lay as much as a finger on him. Frederica now decides it's her time to shine, so she charges up a full power blast of impressive scale. But while the buildup was awe-inspiring, its payoff was not worth it as it was just absorbed by the dark angel. From behind it pops a boy who is really impressed by the power output of her blast considering she is just a human. The homunculus warns the swordmaster that the boy is an abnormal being as well but he takes offense to that and says they still have names. Loot and or game. Frederica doesn't care though and just wants them dead, but as she tries to go for another attack on him, the strength gap between them is made clear as she has her attack stopped by two fingers. Frederica backs off to create enough distance to attack again. But as she does, she realizes she is missing her arm. The missing arm is in the hands of Lute who turned it into candy when he touched her and proceeds to eat Frederica's body part right in front of her. Rick takes over and strikes at Lute with his sword, which seems to be more effective than magic but still not enough to give him an actual challenge. He yells for Lionel to get Frederica to safety while he can, but just then, he gets a notification that he has a guaranteed ultra-rare gacha available right now. He decides there is no better time to try his luck than now, so he leaves it up to chance and uses all his apologems to see what he can get. And as the music stops playing, it is the goddess that has been summoned again. He doesn't think she's going to be very helpful, since she only came to check on him last time, but now she is actually serious about fighting here. The subordinates of the Dark Lord that they are currently fighting aren't even the strongest ones, so she should be able to take care of this pretty easily. They were excited for a moment, expecting the goddess to obliterate the Dark Angel. But imagine their shock when Orgame starts kneeling to her instead, and Lute hugs her because they haven't seen each other for a long time now. It turns out that meeting the goddess was one of the most unlucky things that could have ever happened to him as her ultimate goal in coming here was actually to destroy all of humanity. Meanwhile, back with Yogiri and the others, they have been heading downstairs for a long time, but it doesn't seem like they are actually making any real progress towards their goal from the way things are going. It is almost as if they are stuck in an infinite loop that is meant to protect something up ahead. As they continue to walk, Theo suddenly feels a small amount of the magic belonging to her people. So Daunara asks Shiokiri if he can do something like destroying the mechanism that is keeping them stuck in this loop, but he doesn't think he should mess with it because it might be really important. But moments later, an unexplained slash cuts straight through it, undoing the infinity loop. Yogiri doesn't know what just happened, but since he didn't have to destroy the barrier himself, he's okay with it. However, whatever created that slash is still out on the loose. They head into the basement to see if they find Theo's people, but if you've learned anything by now, the basement always houses the most horrific things. Case in point, the pile of living sludge that were once known as Theo's people. They were likely turned into this, so they could have their magic drained from them, but despite the abomination she is witnessing, Theo is somewhat glad that her sister isn't among the ones that were forced to suffer this fate. She puts them out of their misery with her sword, and now they know what happened to the demons that were kept here, Donora asks what they are going to do now. Yokiri says they should head back to the surface for now, and they'll decide where to go from there depending on what is going on at the moment. He asks Theo what she wants to do, and now that she has seen what she just saw, she has made a vow to kill the Swordmaster with her own hands. Back on the surface, the Swordmaster appoints Rick to be his successor if anything were to happen to him, so even though he doesn't intend on dying here today if he were to die, Rick should be able to hold his own using the power stored inside the tower. Lionel feels terrible for bringing the goddess here when her goal is to wipe out all of humanity, but even if he dies, he will just end up back at the last save point, so he takes a gamble and asks the goddess why she is doing all this. She had a pretty decent relationship with him, so she explains that a long time ago, her boyfriend disappeared without saying anything to her. This is the Dark Lord we're talking about, and after he went missing, she sent a bunch of messengers all over the world to locate him and found out that he was sealed away here. But no matter who she sent out, she was never able to beat the Sword Master. So she started thinking that if she sent someone as unlucky as Lionel here, his bad luck might rub off on them and make the Sword Master lose for once. Lionel knew he had bad luck, but he never thought it was bad enough that a god would use him as her trump card to destroy humanity. To top it all off, she uses a magic mirror to check the status of the people who could pose the biggest threat to her. 
but for some reason, it looks like they all died of unknown causes. Things are going great for the goddess, so she takes out the barrier's core and is about to crush it to finally revive her beloved. Yogiri and the others make it back to the surface just as the goddess is about to break the barrier core, and as she does, it crumbles to pieces allowing time to flow once more. However, instead of the lovely reunion she was hoping for, the Dark Lord plummets to the ground because Yogiri killed him a while ago and everyone is left in utter shock. While everyone is confused, Theo takes the opportunity to run up behind the Swordmaster and slice his head off to get a revenge for what he did to her people. At the same time, that Blade Invader from before stabs the Goddess to gather information while she is in a state of shock. After it leaves, she falls to the ground, but while the stabbing wasn't enough to make her lose her life, she has definitely lost her mind after losing her darling. The rest of the Dark Lord's subordinates prepare to take revenge on the humans for the death of their lord, and since things are going to get bad if he does nothing, Yogiri tells Theo and Donura to hold on to him for a second. He then uses his ability to kill all the subordinates of the Dark Lord as well, and if you're wondering why Theo and Donura needed to hold on to him they didn't, he just wanted to experience it. After all the subordinates are dead, Donura asks if they should do something about the goddess that is firing off blasts indiscriminately. She has just gone insane and holds no hostility towards Yogiri, so he sees no reason to kill her. At the same time, Elway is dragging Hanakawa towards the former tower as the blasts erupt from the goddess. He just wants to go home, but she assures him that there is no need to worry since they won't die from this. Main characters always have plot armor protecting them from getting hit by random shots. She approaches the guys who are taking the front of the goddess's attack and asks if they've seen Yogiri around here. Rick knows Yogiri, but this isn't the best time to be looking for a friend as they are a little busy right now. Oi acknowledges this and decides to help him finish the battle so she can find Yogiri sooner. She scans him and relays that he has become the new Swordmaster, so he should have the power necessary to kill the goddess. Rick gives it a try and lunges forward to attack her, managing to stab her through the gut and finish her off. And now that that's done, Oe is back to searching for Yogiri. It doesn't take long before she spots him through the dust, so she scans him to get a sense of what she is up against. And she immediately regrets coming here. The scam gives her intense nausea as the only information she can get is that Yogiri is the end of all things in the shape of a man, there is nothing that can be him. She starts throwing up, so Yogiri asks if she is alright, but she is too scared to get any closer to him. She makes up an excuse by saying she wanted to deliver Hanakawa to them, but Yogiri doesn't want him in the first place. With nothing else to say, she makes a graceful exit so she doesn't get killed by him, leaving Hanakawa behind to fend for himself. After all is said and done, there are only a few people left alive. There are many things Rick would like to ask about, starting with Theo over there that sliced off the Swordmaster's head mid-fight. She says what she did is justified, so it has nothing to do with him, but while he didn't exactly like the Swordmaster after his death, Rick is now the new Swordmaster, so he is kind of involved. Yogiri tells Rick to go take a look in the basement to see what the old Swordmaster was doing behind closed doors. And if he still wants to go after Theo, then Yogiri will side with her. Rick doesn't get what he thinks he can do because, up till now, he has yet to see Yogiri do any fighting. But the Divine King tells him off for being ignorant and informs our misinformed friend that Yogiri was the one who killed the Dark Lord and all his subordinates. The power he possesses is immeasurable, so Rick understands that if he says she was justified, then he can't argue. He asks what they all plan to go from here, and Theo states she will keep looking for her sister, Euphemia. Yogiri and Donora remember hearing that name back in Hanabusa, so she decides to head there first. Meanwhile, Yogiri and Donora will be heading to the royal capital. So Rick provides them with two pendants that should get them in with no issues. With that, they head off on their next journey, leaving Hanakawa behind again and elsewhere. Sion gets news that Aoi has gone off the grid after encountering Yogiri. She is starting to get curious to learn what Yogiri really is, so she decides to summon someone who knew him from Earth. She summons a random scientist and asks him about Yogiri, but when the guy learns that she brought Yogiri to this world, he thanks her for saving all of humanity on Earth. Unfortunately, since Yogiri has been using his ability here, it sets off a code red on the scientist's device, which in turn blows off his head and leaves soon more confused than ever about the origins of Yogiri. Back on the bus the students first arrived on, one of the students wakes up and begins hearing a computer voice playing in her head. It informs her that there isn't much time left, so she's going to have to bear with it and accept the BS it's about to explain. She is apparently an artificial human, and the body consists of several units which work together to function normally. The one in control of the body right now is the personality unit as it has the highest authority among them, so she's the one who gets to make the decision on what they do from here. Ayaka's body has limitations placed on it to imitate a human, but the hole in her chest is incompatible with life, so she can either choose to keep being human, 
or take the limiters off and stay alive. She never even liked any of her classmates to begin with, so she obviously doesn't want to die because of them and agrees to release the limiters. With the limits broken, her body will be able to repair itself, but she's going to need a lot of organic material to do so, and it just so happens that there is a dragon corpse just laying outside the bus. She hesitantly grabs a chunk of flesh, but after taking one bite, she realizes this ain't that bad, actually. We get another flashback to Yogiri's time with Asaka, and she was really struggling to prepare a family meal with the cooking skills of a broke college student. Whatever it was she tried to make, Gordon Ramsay would not approve in the slightest, and neither does Yogiri, as he tells her straight up that her food is trash. She can't handle being roasted by a seven-year-old, so she yells at him that he needs to say the food is delicious no matter what when a girl cooks for him. Otherwise, he'll never get laid. Yo Gary doesn't really get what she's talking about, but she just tells him to say her food is delicious even if he doesn't think it is. He says it's delicious, but that lie doesn't make her feel any better because deep down she knows her cooking skills suck. Yo Gary ends up finishing the travesty of a meal, and now that food has been taken care of, Asaka looks at the list and sees her next task is to teach him some elementary school stuff. She's getting fed up with the amount of work she has to do for this job, and she doesn't even get a bonus for it. She resigns herself to her fate and begins teaching Yogiri how to write when she suddenly hears the sound of someone approaching. Yogiri isn't too bothered by it since he knows it is probably just the porter that brings supplies every once in a while. She goes to check and finds that the porter is actually a robot that they send down here because all the people are too scared to be near Yogiri, and once Asaka realizes this thing brings supplies for them, she asks for some elementary school equipment and a cookbook so she can learn to suck less at cooking. And some things for entertainment as well, but with that taken care of, she goes back over to check on Yogiri and decides he has worked hard enough for the day, so she says it's time for a break to play outside. They get outside and Asaka still can't wrap her head around how this place has such a wonderful view, but is actually located underground. Yogiri is having fun playing in the artificial nature here, but Asaka can't help but worry that she won't make it out alive of this place for some reason. The month ends and Asaka is set to give her report on what has been going on with Yogiri. The scientist applauds her for successfully surviving a whole month on the job as this is an all-time record. She complains that she has finished teaching him elementary school work, but anything higher is beyond her level of expertise, but the scientist assures her that it will be fine since they can just use a remote education system for that. Asaka was hoping to get an actual person to teach Yogiri, but while that would have been ideal, it's not exactly easy to fill the position when you have to sign a death waiver to take the job. The scientist asks if she isn't happy with her current working conditions, and she's obviously dissatisfied after she was locked in there for a month, but the scientist knows just the thing to persuade her and drops a fat stack of cash on the table. And once Asaka opens it, all the dissatisfaction immediately leaves her body. There is still the issue of not being able to use the money while she's stuck down here, but she's free to take a break from work whenever she wishes. It was in the contract, but they thought she would die early or resign before she would ever need to take a break, so they forgot to mention it to her. Asaka is a little worried about who will take care of Yogiri while she's gone, but he should be fine with just the robots as long as she's only gone for a few days. She is just now realizing that there were robots who could have been cooking for them this entire time, so there was no reason for her to learn how to cook. But at least after the past month, her cooking isn't as bad as it initially was. Asaka decides to take the break right now and slams the paperwork on the table, and we later see her napping on a bed, but when she wakes up, she isn't familiar with this location at all. She tries to remember what she was doing before she blacked out, which was some shopping. Some more shopping. And even more shopping before ending off the night by getting the best room available in a hotel. That was an amazing night, but that doesn't explain how she ended up here. She thinks she may have been abducted, and a voice tells her that she is correct about that assumption. She was indeed kidnapped, but there's no need to worry because they are nice kidnappers and have no intention of harming or harvesting her organs. That obviously doesn't sound very reassuring, but the voice goes on to state that they are an organization that seeks to save the world by sealing away the danger, so they would just like her to answer some questions for them. Meanwhile, back in Yogiri's confinement base, he has noticed Asaka has been gone for a while, so he asks one of the robots what happened to her. The robot informs him that she is currently on a leave of absence, but he wonders when she will be back. He was getting a little lonely, so he decided to go outside and look for her himself, but first, he asked another one of the robots if it knows where she went, but it doesn't have access to that information. So Yogiri then asks who would have information about Asaka, and is informed that the researchers would likely know. The robot really sold out the entire facility and leads Yogiri to the door that will allow him to go outside. However, it explains that this door cannot be opened from the inside since it is remote controlled, so Yogiri just calls out to the scientists that are watching in the cameras and tells them to open the door. 
Some stuff happens, and the lead researcher makes it to the room only to find that all except one woman are dead. The woman was the only one who listened to Yogiri and opened the doors. But when the other scientists tried to stop her, they were all killed in an instant. Right now, the woman is currently opening every door Yogiri asks her to with tears in her eyes because she doesn't want to die and the lead researcher can't stop her. He never thought you would be able to kill people even when he can't directly see them. But since things have come to this, he tells the guard standing behind him to shoot the woman that is opening the doors. However, before he could even take aim, Yogiri had already put him out of commission and he dropped to the ground. The lead has nothing more he can do, so as Yogiri walks up to him and asks where Asaka is, he answers the question. She is currently on leave, but he doesn't think she will be coming back anytime soon because she was abducted by a certain organization. Yogiri asks why they haven't tried to save her yet, but this facility is unable to challenge that organization because they are too powerful. If that is the case, Yogiri says he'll just go and save her himself, but he also tells him to not mention all the people that died here today to Asaka when she gets back. And the next thing we know, there's chaos all over that organization's base as Yogiri is making his way in and killing all the soldiers that tried to stop him. The heads of the organization aren't surprised that their fodder soldiers weren't enough to stop him as they believe Yogiri can kill anything that he looks at. But that makes their job simply to kill him before he can look at them. Unfortunately, they were wrong about the conditions of Yogiri's ability, as once all the snipers had gotten into position and were ready to fire, they all dropped dead before their fingers could even get close to the trigger. Meanwhile, Asaka is still in her holding cell, wishing she had applied for a more normal job. But she is also worried about Yogiri's well-being since she can't be there to look after him. Just then, she hears explosions from the chaos happening outside and thinks this might be a good opportunity to escape while everyone is in a state of confusion. But as she heads for the door, the head of the organization comes in and points a gun at her. Asaka is now being held at gunpoint by her and used as a meat shield to get Yogiri to back off. Yogiri is glad he has finally found Asaka. The head tries to blackmail Yogiri by telling him she will kill Asaka if he comes any closer, but that goes about as well as you would expect. Once Asaka is safe, Yokiri runs up to her and asks to go home. So the two head out of the organization and Asaka sees the carnage Yogiri caused while trying to get to her. And while she is taken aback at first, Yogiri did all this for her sake, so she holds his hand tighter and smiles at him. They later return to the confinement base where the lead researcher is waiting because he wants to have a chat with Asaka. She asks what is going to happen now after that whole incident, but really despite all the people that died, nothing is going to be done. It's not like anyone has the power to punish Yogiri for what he did in the first place. She then asks what is going to happen to her then, but since Yogiri has clearly grown attached, it looks like she's stuck doing this job now. However, he assures her that next time she wants to take a break, they will assign her a guard so something like this doesn't happen again. While Asaka doesn't like how he said it, she also doesn't have any intentions of abandoning her job either because she can tell that if she leaves Yogiri as he is now, he is likely to go on a rampage at the next slight inconvenience for him. So she needs to teach him a bit more to get him to the point where he won't be a danger to the world. Back to the present, Donora is staring at Yogiri while he is sleeping and Mokomoko can tell that she is into Yogiri now. She doesn't exactly deny it and Mokomoko would be more than happy to have Yogiri added to the family bloodline, so Donora's got her blessing for those grandkids. And she isn't opposed to the idea either. Yogiri wakes up soon after, so Donora makes Mokomoko swear to not mention anything about having children with Yogiri. So she changes the subject and says they have arrived in front of the capital gates, but she has no idea what they are going to do from here. They are also surrounded by guards who have come to investigate the strange new arrivals, so the captain asks them to step out of the vehicle. As they chat with the guard captain, Torx, he asks them to identify themselves. So they tell him that they are sage candidates trying to get here for a trial. That would make sense, but Torx doesn't trust them yet, however, as soon as Yogira pulls out the pendant Rick gave him, the guards all fall to their knees as that is a pendant of the royal family. Rick is apparently a member of the royal family, so Torx agrees to let them get into the capital. But then someone comes out and says just because they have a royal family pendant doesn't mean they can break the rules. This is David, Rick's younger brother, and since he is also a member of the royal family, he sees no need to accommodate people just because they apparently know his brother. He wants them to show him some proof that they went through the Swordmaster trial by facing him in battle since there is no way they would lose if what they claimed was true, especially since he isn't that good with a sword. Donora wants to back out, but Mokomoko eggs her on because David isn't an overpowered sword fighter. They get into position for the fight and Mokomoko explains the fighting style she taught Donora. 
While David is using the orthodox methods, Donora is playing by street rules, so as the match begins, Donora immediately throws her knife straight at him, and while he was distracted by the knife, she ducks down and dashes behind him before landing a devastating kick and preparing some scrambled eggs. It is safe to say that he is down for the count, so she is declared the winner of the match. The rest of the guards praise her for the skill she just displayed as they've never seen anything quite like it before, but that's all part of the secret technique training Mokomoko gave her. And on another note, he is still on the floor in as much pain as ever, so Yogiri asks if they should do something about that, but Donora thinks he should be fine since she didn't kick him that hard after all. A while later, Yogiri is taking a look at the castle walls when David, who has finally recovered, comes up behind him, and explains that it has a spell cast on it by a great wizard named Iglesia, who is the same guy Yogiri killed in the tower, but he had better not mention that part. David offers to guide the two through the city, and it turns out he is not a bad guy after all, he was just a bit suspicious of them. After showing them around for a bit, Yogiri says they'll be fine to go alone from here because he has something he needs to discuss with Donora. They'll be meeting their classmates soon, so she needs to decide whether she will forgive them for what they did or not. They head to the castle where the rest of the class is gathered for a speech from the king, but as the king begins speaking, one of the students gets up and says he doesn't have the right to talk down to them because he's not their king, so the king gets up and gets right in his face. The boy was confident in his ability to defend himself because of his ability. But something happens that prevents him from using his freeze ability so the king cuts off his fingers and proves that while the boy may not be his subject, he can still make him his bitch anytime he wants. We see Cheyenne walking in a grassy field as seemingly looking for something, and as she walks through a barrier which leads to a white subspace, she finds what she was looking for. Oe, who has been thoroughly traumatized by horrors she saw when she tried to scan Yogiri. Once Oe realizes Cheyenne is there, she starts yelling at her for dooming this world to death thanks to her careless actions of bringing Yogiri. She knows she's an assassin, but this was never in the job description, so she wants nothing to do with any missions involving Yogiri or his friends. It doesn't look like she'll be leaving her panic room anytime soon, so Cheyenne tries asking the talking sword she carries with her what happened. The sword explains that Aoi has been like this ever since she first encountered Yogiri, so Cheyenne asks what information they managed to gather on him after their encounter. They weren't able to get much from scanning Yogiri, but they did learn a few things from Hanakawa though. Meanwhile, Hanakawa is laying on the ground and begging for his life as he usual does. The boy that was serving the goddess had asked him to state what he knows about Yogiri, so he frantically starts explaining everything he knows about Yogiri's ability to kill anything he thinks about. He even warns him not to think he is an exception to the rule because he certainly isn't, but the boy still doesn't believe Yogiri is actually able to do all that. It's not that Lute doesn't believe what Hanakawa is telling him, but his top priority right now is to kill Yogiri, and to do that, he will call upon powers that must be greater than Yogiri. He pulls out a key which I assume summons Kolu, but it's actually something far worse. It is a key to the seal that holds the Dark Lord's sister. The Dark Lord's sister is so messed up that the Dark Lord had to personally seal her away when he found an opportunity to do so. And if she was scary enough to make the Dark Lord fear her, she should have enough power to beat Yogiri. That's all well and good, but having dealt with Yogiri before, and now hearing about this banshee of a little sister, he wants to excuse himself as a member of the main cast and live a peaceful life as an NPC. Unfortunately, as he was backing away with great speed, Let pops up behind him and grabs his hair because he still needs Hanakawa around. He doesn't have a lot of information on Yogiri, so he is going to bring him along. Hanakawa really doesn't want to go, especially since people would think he is gay if he travels alone with another boy. He gets dragged by the hair as he complains that he would have liked it more being dragged around by a girl. Meanwhile, back at the meeting with the king, the kid who got his fingers chopped off is receiving some limited medical attention from his classmates, while the king casually informs them that they are required to traverse the underground labyrinth beneath the capital and defeat the Dark God in order to attain their titles as sages. The king honestly thinks they are just going to die in there because they lack the skills necessary to pull it off. But it's not his job to care, so he isn't going to complain about it. Also to explain why the boy's ability didn't work when he tried to use it earlier, it's because the royal family in this world have the ability to weaken the powers of sages, so while they are within a certain range of him, their powers won't work. But he doesn't have to worry about his fingers since once the king has stepped far enough away from here, then they should be able to reattach all his fingers. The king makes his exit, and all the students are left silent as they wonder what they should do now. All the while, Yogiri and Danara are standing in the back and watching this unfold. Danara finally speaks up and gets the attention of her classmates, who are all stunned and confused by the fact that she is still alive, while also completely ignoring Yogiri's existence. 
Elsewhere in the kingdom, the others from the Tower Trial have just gotten off the train with the Divine King and have brought her to what should be her church. As she walks in, she is greeted by a man named Holers, who informs her that he is the current Archbishop of this church. The Divine King's first thought after being revived a thousand years later was to return home, but she never would have thought this place would change so much in the time she was gone. Holers offers to show her the way to her room, where he sits down to have a chat with her. He says he is overjoyed that she is back, but they had thought she was stuck keeping the Dark God at bay over by the tower. That much is true, but thankfully, the Dark God was slain so she is now free. In that case, Holerus asks what happened to the seal key, but the Divine King had never heard of any seal, so she doesn't know what to say. Holerus believes she actually doesn't know about it, so he pulls out a magic item and uses it to weaken her. While that happens, Yogiri and Donora are having a discussion with their class president and he straight up tells them that he doesn't think it was a bad decision to leave them behind, and if put in the same situation again, he would do the same thing. She asks if he is displeased that they survived the dragon, but before he can answer, another one of their classmates comes over and says they shouldn't be fighting with one another in a world where they have so few allies. The girl seems to be well known, but Yogiri never paid attention in class so he has no idea who she is. Donora informs him that she is called Akino, and back on Earth, she was a famous idol in the entertainment business, so it's no surprise that she is so really popular among her classmates. Yazaki makes the argument that they can't be sure they can trust the two, but she points out that he is only saying that because he knows that if he were put in the same situation they had to go through, then he would have definitely been seeking revenge by now. With how she is talking, it is clear that Akino is the one in charge here, meaning Yazaki lost a large chunk of his influence on the class a while ago. Yogiri and Donara end up being accepted into the group, so Yogiri heads to a lounge area with some of the other boys. They are complaining that the girls are allowed to move between the first and second floors freely, but the boys are banned from entering the second floor for any reason. While they were talking, they realize Yogiri has no idea who they are, which is a little hurtful since Izumita actually put a lot of effort into talking to Yogiri back on Earth. He tells Yogiri that they are the losers of the class and he presumed Yogiri is one as well since his gift says he is just an insect hunter, meaning he can only kill bugs with his ability. The others here have abilities ranging from reader to master cook, but not the useful kind of cooking. There is a knock at the door and another guy called Fukai shows up wanting to speak to Yogiri. Meanwhile, upstairs, Donora learns why the guys are banned from coming up to the second floor and it is mainly because of the people with the ability of high plot. There are three guys in the class who got the ability of Master, Meister, and Maniac in their respective preferred tags. One can stop time, while another is able to look through clothes with X-ray vision. And the last guy just straight up has tentacles, so the girls naturally avoid them at all costs. Just then, there is a knock at the door here as well, and the two girls who know of Yogiri's true nature have come to have a discussion with Donora regarding him. Downstairs, Yogiri is talking with Fukai and asks what he wants, so Fukai responds by referring to him as a god, and telling him that in this world, he has also become a death god, so he can now do the same thing he has admired Yogiri for. At this point, Yogiri can tell Fukai was tasked with keeping an eye on him back on Earth, and he knows he probably has reasons preventing him from sharing too much information like a neck bomb. But he asks what he is here for. Fukai explains that while he was tasked with keeping an eye on Yogiri, he was never allowed to look at him directly. He then proceeds to poke out his own eye and place it on the table. That eye was one that can detect the supernatural, so if he looked at Yogiri directly, he probably would have ended up as traumatized as Awa. After he leaves, Yogiri picks up the eye he left on the table and asks the other guys if they want to keep it, which they really don't. Following that, Danura comes in accompanied by the other two girls and asks to talk to Yogiri. They head outside, and Ryuko immediately bows down and apologizes for what she has done. She urges Carol to do the same because now that Yogiri unsealed the first gate, he is able to kill anyone no matter where they are. So if they get on his bad side, then he can get rid of them whenever he wants. Carol finds it funny to see Ryuko freaking out like that when she is usually so calm and Yogiri realizes that these two have been watching him as well. Carol is from the organization, Ryuko is from the institute, and Fukai is from a cult that worships him. He knew people were surveilling him, but he never would have thought there would be three separate people. Carol changes the subject and asks about Yogiri and Donora's relationship and if any non-family friendly things happen between them. Donora denies this very quickly, but Yogiri ignores the question and just asks what is going to happen now. Elsewhere, Euphemia is sitting on a rock and missing her sister, Theo, when a vampire approaches her and proclaims that she will become the heir to the bloodline by killing her, and though she doesn't really want to, Euphemia is forced to kill her on the spot. Back to Yogiri and Donora, they've been given the rundown on everything that happened with the class recently. 
and also find out that Akino's ability makes it possible to restrict the use of one's abilities, particularly the Hentai protagonists. That aside, Yokiri tells him he came here so he could talk to Shine about getting home, so the others agree to join forces with him. The next day, the students are set to head into the dungeon for the first time, and they are all wearing outfits that match their abilities, but look way goofier than they intended. The guy for their expedition soon arrives and Donora is shocked to find out that it is Rick who will be helping them. On the boys' end, the one assisting them is David who informs the group that as a member of the royal family, his power is able to fully suppress a demonic creature and Uduri asks that he suppress their powers as well so they can test out how capable they are here. The battle begins and Yogiri uses the lines of malicious intent to dodge the attacks from a monkey demon, before finishing it off with a stab to the head, leaving the others impressed with his capabilities. Meanwhile, up in the city, Hanakawa is in tears as he walks with Luke. Luke heard Hanakawa complaining that he would rather travel with a girl, and he went. He is now dressed up as a girl and asks if there is some kind of festival going on here since the people seem to be very lively. Hanakawa begins to mock Luke for not knowing anything about city life, despite him not knowing what festival is happening either. In any case, the sister of the Dark God should be sealed away somewhere in the capital, so they are going to have to search around until they find her. Euphemia is currently walking through the woods after she got herself promoted to the Origin Blood status by accident, when she nearly gets trampled by a horse. She tells the horse to stop and it listens to her, halting its charge while a little girl comes running up after it. The girl apologizes for losing control of her horse, but Euphemia takes one look at her and immediately bows to her, because this is the separate clone Lane had made before she died. The girl doesn't have a name yet, so she makes one up on the spot and decides she will be called Risley from now on. Back in the capital, Loot and Hanako ahead to a local tavern, so they can gather some information on where the Dark God's sister may be located. There, Loot asks a waitress what the festival is about, so she explains that it is to celebrate the fact that the Sage candidates have all come to the capital and are on the fifth floor of the labyrinth, despite only recently starting her conquest. After learning this, Hanakawa looks over and notices that some of his classmates are seated across from them, so it would be really bad if they spotted him. To solve the issue, Lure uses a disguise spell to prevent them from being recognized, however, in a turn of events, Ayako walks into the tavern and immediately starts beating one of them. Nothing the others do is able to stop her, and once she is completely caved in the guy's skull, she declares that she will kill one of her classmates every day as part of her revenge. After she has left, Shine shows up and begins questioning Hanakawa about Yogiri. He tells her everything he knows, and once he is of no use to her anymore, Shine prepares to use her death ray to kill him. However, it doesn't work and instead covers him in cream. Hanakawa manages to live another day and later Yogiri and the others are planning on how best to find Shine. And since she will show up if they fail to become sages, Yogiri thinks that's the safest bet to meet her. Meanwhile, Shine and her confidant are deliberating what to do about Yogiri, so she enlists the help of Utori to get rid of him in exchange for extending the deadline for the others to become sages. Ayaka is currently atop a tower looking for her next victim among her classmates, but she is unable to find anyone. Since she is a robot, her system begins analyzing the DNA that was gotten from the dragon meat she ate, but while it was busy doing that, a rock gets thrown in her head with a great deal of force and accuracy. She is durable enough to not immediately die from it, but it still hurts like hell, so she asks the system to find where the attacks are originating from. As more rocks are sent hurtling towards her, the system is able to pinpoint the attack's location, and as a precautionary measure, it advises that she uses her flight ability to close the gap between her and the sniper as soon as possible. Shinoyama Riona, who has the ability to increase her strength by several times her normal capacity, and she came in with the game plan of just chucking rocks. She couldn't just let Shinozaki get away with hunting down innocent people for the sake of her own twisted sense of revenge. So now that they are face to face, she switches from her main plan of throwing rocks to her backup plan of throwing hands. As Riona tries to box Shinozaki into submission, all of her attacks seem to be reflected by some sort of barrier she had set up, so they aren't able to connect as she would like them to. Having learned all she needs, Shinozaki finally fights back, and as expected, Ryona gets beaten, also losing an arm in the process. In the face of defeat and having lost an arm, rather than scream out in pain, she begins looking for excuses for her loss by saying Shinozaki only won because of the royal family that weakens the gifts of all the students within the capital. Meanwhile, Hanakawa and Loot have just entered the dungeon where the Dark Lord's sister should be held captive. He is eager to get on with the revival by traversing the dungeon, but Hanakawa remains hesitant because they have no plan of attack heading in here. He could just leave him behind if he keeps complaining so much, but the fact remains that they don't know their way around here, so they would probably just end up getting lost if they tried it now. 
Just then, they notice a girl standing suspiciously in the middle of the dungeon. Hanakawa wonders if she is one of the explorers of the dungeon, but that doesn't seem to be the case as Loot recognizes her. He calls out to Mana and asks what she is doing all the way out here. She had recognized the smell of her sibling, but she couldn't wait for them to reach her, so she came out instead. Hanakawa is even more confused at this point, so he asks Loot for the identity of the girl, and she is revealed to be the one they are looking for, the Dark Lord's little sister. Elsewhere, we see an assassination bounty has just been put on Yogiri's head, but as for the man himself, he is sitting in his room all day, which Donora scolds him for doing nothing by being lazy. He corrects her by saying he is actually spending time learning to control his powers so he doesn't just kill people immediately. As evidenced by his ability to now only kill a portion of a flower, instead of the whole thing at once. However, aside from his training, he really hasn't done much since they got here, aside from a little stroll around town and his snack while he strolled. Donora gets up and says he must really be enjoying the peaceful time he has if he can have so much fun despite the situation. But it's not like he had a completely peaceful time either, as while he was walking through town, he was targeted by someone. That sounds pretty bad to Donora, which is why Yogiri wants her help with something he has planned. Back in the labyrinth, Hanakawa asks Mana if she was really sealed away down here, which she confirms to be true, although she still doesn't really know the reason for it. However, she has a major brother complex, so she isn't even mad at the Dark Lord for sealing her away and believes she must have done something to deserve it somehow. Her delusions aside, Hanakawa asks how she was able to come to the first floor if she is meant to be sealed in the depths of this place, and the answer is actually pretty simple. She could leave whenever she wanted since the seal isn't strong enough to hold her. Her delusions led her to believe that her brother didn't want to be too strict with her, so he made the seal weak enough for her to be able to leave if she ever wanted to. Liv clarifies that she knows for a fact that the Dark Lord used every bit of strength he had to offer in order to seal Mana away, but it would seem that wasn't enough to keep her down. With that out of the way, Mana takes a moment to ask if they have any of her brother's belongings with them since she can smell his scent on them. Luke responds that they brought the key to the seal that was holding her, so he hands it over immediately. Meanwhile, Shinozaki is flying over the castle, and has just used her system to locate the castle where the king should be, as well as the person she believes would be the king here. She bursts into the king's room while he was getting busy and tells him straight that she wants him to deactivate the barrier that weakens the sage's gifts. He obviously goes for the offensive route since she is an unknown intruder, but he was not built to handle the amount of main character energy she possesses, so he gets fried to a crisp almost immediately. Shibazaki then turns to the woman in his bed and confirms with her that he is indeed the king of the kingdom, and once she is certain of that, she leaves since the barrier should be down now. Meanwhile, Mana has brought Loot and Hanakoa to the town she created for herself in the dungeon, and I'm not saying she's crazy, but she fantasized about having kids with her brother so much that they became real. However, Hanakawa definitely thinks she's crazy. After killing the king, Shinozaki pulls up to the hospital where Raona was recovering and tells her to resume the throwing of hands she was doing before. Now that the king is dead, she should be at full power, so there will be no excuses this time. Raona seems like she's ready to go, so she gets out of bed to attack her. And from the blow she just landed, she may actually stand a chance against Shinozaki like this. They end up outside, but Rayona isn't letting up as she knees Shinozaki into the air and proceeds pound her face in. Unfortunately, she still doesn't have a solution for Shinozaki's attacks as she gets her arm chopped off and her body suspended in the air while she is choked out. If even at her strongest, Shinozaki is still this much more powerful than her, then there is nothing left to prove, so she will kill her now. After Shinozaki's rampage the night before, reconstruction is underway, but none of that matters to Yogiri as he is taking a nice walk with Danura. He wants to find the people who are targeting him, and since Damnora has good eyesight, he was hoping she would be able to spot them if they try anything. She's a little disappointed since she thought Yogiri was asking her out on a date, but she still manages to turn it into one anyway. At the same time, a sniper is being aimed at Yogiri's head, and although the gunman doesn't want to do it since he knows it will mean he gets killed, he is also being tortured into firing the gun by this girl. She wants to figure out if an unwilling murder attempt still counts enough for Yogiri to notice, and from the guy's lifeless body, it looks like Yogiri noticed. Next, the girl plans to target Danura to see what happens. Danura drags Yogiri to her favorite restaurant only to find it completely destroyed by Shinozaki's rampage. She is angry, but there are still other places that she can go to with Yogiri, so she starts searching the map. Just then, a bullet is shot, so Yogiri pulls her out of the way before she is killed, leading to a random dude in the background meeting his end. 
The guy behind the computer orders for more shots to be fired, but he didn't realize the mess he had gotten himself into when he messed with Yogiri's girl as Yogiri is now after him. He immediately tries to vacate the country for the sake of his life, but Yogiri kills his helicopter mid-flight and causes him to crash. He parachutes out, but almost immediately after, Donara appears behind him and piles drives his head into the ground. Once the guy regains his footing, he finds himself face to face with Yogiri. The fact that he didn't immediately run away means he knows all about Yogiri's powers. At the same time, Mokomoko makes herself useful and takes out some spirits that were sent after Donara. She proceeds to finish off the two spirits by smashing their heads together. The guy starts sweating now and throws all the spirits at Yogiri, but they are all killed one after the other. He has nothing left to fight back with, but before anything else can happen, a knife is thrown at Yogiri by the girl from earlier. And this time, he was actually taken by surprise and needed to be saved by Danura. He actually seems to know the girl and says a command which forces Enju to go offline. He tells Danura that he will explain everything later, but first he threatens the guy so he tells him everything he knows. Meanwhile, Utori is doing his own research on Yogiri's capabilities and trying to come up with a way to counter them. Back with Hanakawa and Luke, they are being led around by Mana, and Luke takes the opportunity to apologize to Hanakawa for bringing him all the way out here. He appreciates the apology, but it sounds like he's getting ready to die with how he is talking. Lute hands Hanakoa the key to the seal and says he is now the representative of the Dark Lord, so Mana probably won't kill him as well, but she is definitely going to kill Lute once she finds out he let her brother die. Back on the surface with Yogiri, the man has just told him everything that he knows and promises not to come after him any longer, but Yogiri says he is still going to kill him anyway. Yogiri knows that the guy's ability allows him to create any object from Earth here, meaning he could make as many Enju clones as he wants, and that's something Yogiri can't let happen, so he has to die. They later bring Enju to a room where Yogiri explains that she is someone who we used to play with as a kid. Or to be exact, it is a robot that was modeled after Enju, but this one was made to kill him. He wants her to be able to rest forever, but that doesn't mean she is dead. She's probably doing fine right now and relaxing at home. What he was referring to was the robot version of her since no one would want a robot version of themselves out in the world doing evil stuff. Meanwhile, Shinrazaki is going after more of her classmates, but she chose to go after the chef, and we all know he's about to cook. Shinrazaki's arm gets chopped off in an instant, and she's left shocked since she was sure of her dragon scales could block any attack. One of Yugo's abilities allows him to cleave anything he considers to be an ingredient, so no shield can block his attacks. With that being the case, Shinozaki tries slicing him up before he can attack again, but he just appears again as reveals that another one of his abilities allows him to be in multiple places at once to cook efficiently. He also knows the exact location of anything he considers as an ingredient, so she can't hide from him either. However, while his abilities are definitely broken, he didn't have an answer for the most important part of being a chef, so he got cooked. After Yugo was killed, a meeting was held among the surviving class members to decide what to do from here on out. They are being killed at an alarming rate, and the kingdom has asked them to leave immediately because of Shinozaki's constant attacks, so the only option left for them is to complete their objective as soon as possible, and all head into the dungeon. We next see them on the sixth floor of the dungeon, and David has volunteered to go with Yogiri and Danura because he wanted to see this floor with his own eyes. The class prepares to battle an army composed of thousands of monsters, and honestly isn't much of a challenge for them, as they wipe every single one out. Meanwhile, in Mana's chambers, Lude informs her that her brother is dead. He was expecting an outburst of emotion from her, but she calmly states that she knows death will come for everyone, and she will definitely take revenge on the ones who killed her brother. But first, she's going to have to make sure he comes back by giving birth to him. Hanako doesn't believe he heard her right, but she was dead serious about it, and took Lude's arm so she can use the essence of the Dark Lord on him to make it happen. She was about to take his head as well, but Hanako stops her and asks if she can at least let him live. She surprisingly agrees to let Lute live as long as Hanakawa undoes the seal, so he does so without hesitation. Back with the class, they are setting up camp for the night and build a frickin' castle to rest in. They have a party to celebrate their success in getting through the underworld easily so far, but Yogiri is nowhere to be found and is spending his time playing games outside. He ends up spotting David who seems to be acting strangely, so he follows him until he sees that he's about to walk straight into a pit. Yogiri stops him, but he is still unresponsive and moments later a menacing aura begins to emerge from the hole as the ground shakes. 
Meanwhile, back at the castle, Cheyenne has just shown up and doesn't like that things have been so easy for the class, so she wants them to just kill each other until someone gets strong enough to be a sage. The news causes great worry among the class, but they have bigger things to worry about as Yogiri seems to have opened his second gate as he plunged into the pit. This was the end of episode 10. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.